John S. Dickerson is an author, speaker, and the senior pastor of Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church in Prescott, Arizona. He is a nationally awarded journalist, having written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN. His book, The Great Evangelical Recession, combines his background in investigative journalism with his understanding and love of the evangelical church. Please welcome John S. Dickerson. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. I, I feel like I uh, know you and that we know Christ, and we have a common heart here. The reason you're up on a Saturday morning and here is we want to learn how to expose the heart of God to the souls around us who need him. I want to start by talking about some tensions that we experience when we do speak up in a culture that has rather quickly become a post-Christian culture. Here's a first tension. Uh, sometimes it seems like we're speaking a different language. Have you ever felt this way? Uh, I began to notice this in a newsroom when I worked in mainstream media. Began noticing it about eight years ago. Uh, here's, a few, here's a few ideas that can be put into different language depending on your belief system. Uh, question, is, is it abortion or is it reproductive rights? Well, uh, depending on who your editor is in my environment as a newspaper reporter, uh, it's, it's reproductive rights. Um, sometimes uh, Christians will uh, get into hot water for speaking out about LGBT issues in our society today. And, and, and here's a question. When that happens, is that, a, is that a matter of religious liberty or is that a matter of bigotry? Well, it, it kind of depends on what language you're speaking I was in uh, Naples actually just yesterday speaking to a number of Christians there, and I was speaking with a Christian mother who has raised her daughters in a Baptist church and going to Bible clubs and Sunday schools, and these daughters are both college-aged now. And she was expressing to me frustration because she says, my, my daughters both say that I'm a bigot and that I'm prejudiced and that I'm closed-minded, but... I, I don't think I am, and, and part of the difference is that, that her daughters, they're speaking a different language than she is. Here's another thing we experience when we, uh, when we really step out to represent Christ in a post-Christian culture. Sometimes, increasingly, we're, we're prejudged. That is, you, you go out and you're really trying to show love. You're really trying... To, to show grace and kindness and, and reasons, and yet there are, uh, there are times when it just seems like you're, you're prejudged. Here's another tension that we uh, sometimes experience. Sometimes we've got really, really great answers to questions that the people we're giving the answers to, they're just not even asking the questions yet. Well, I don't know if you can relate to any of these tensions, as you've done your best to represent Christ in your family or in your neighborhood or in your workplace, maybe there's been a time you've experienced one of these tensions. Really what all these funnel down to is this. How do we represent Christ in a post-Christian culture? That is a culture where assumptions have changed. A culture where secular and mainstream sociologists say that the actual rate of cultural change is accelerating. So as a result, language is changing, values are changing, assumptions are changing. The, the very moral fabric of the society is kind of tearing and, and reforming. It's a place where now morals are crowdsourced. So how do we represent Christ in this kind of society? Well, I want to take you into the unchanging, timeless word of God this morning to equip you to be, to be really the presence of God in a changing culture. And as we do, we're going to be resurrecting the art of ambassadorship. Resurrecting the art of ambassadorship. Uh, one of the challenges when I, when I wrote this book, The Great Evangelical Recession, uh, what, what I set out to do was combine my journalism skills and experience with my heart as a pastor and to assess how is the church in North America doing? Uh, how are we doing at representing Christ in this culture? Uh, and, and there's a number of trends that are documented in there with, with hard evidence that, that indicate that we're losing a lot of ground. There's a lot of ways in which we're not representing Christ well. Uh, and there's some great biblical solutions in here as well. 
But, but one of the, the underlying realities is that as, as American culture has changed uh, from a somewhat monolithic, right? If you watched uh, the TV news in the 1960s or 70s, you were watching news on either ABC, CBS, or NBC, right? And they were almost identical what they reported and how they did it. Well, now if you watch TV news, uh, you might be getting it from Comedy Central, or, or you're very more likely to just watch it online uh, through Huffington Post. There's literally dozens, hundreds of places, and, and they're all, they become tribal. That It's not monolithic anymore. So one of the challenges for the church as a whole in America is we have to adapt from representing Christ in a culture where people shared some of our values and assumptions to now learning to actually be ambassadors. And that is to show Christ to people who don't share our values and assumptions. And for many of us, especially those of us who grew up in the church or, or those who, who lived through the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, it, this is just, it's a paradigm shift for us. Uh, but it's not for the New Testament Christians. Paul the Apostle and all the New Testament believers, they were all sharing Christ in a non-Christian culture. So let's look at a text here where Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. God, who he reconciled himself to us, or us to him through Christ, now he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. This is really incredible when you think about it. When you think that the creator God, who created all human beings in his image and to be in perfect relationship with him, after sin separated humanity from God, and God came on this great rescue mission of redemption in Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. He reconciled us to him who have faith in Christ. And now, think about this. He's entrusted the ministry of reconciliation uh, to the angels? No, to, to us. What a massive responsibility. And it continues that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Think about this, when Jesus left and said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he called the church his body. That is, the presence of Christ is still on earth and it's in this room, it's in his followers. When the people of God are full of the Holy Spirit and are, are led by the word of God, we become the presence of God on earth. And, and the people of earth who are, who are uh, scripture says, blinded by the God of this world, Whose, whose, whose foolish minds are darkened, Paul said. There's no other way that they're going to fully know this message of reconciliation than through us. This is why we are on earth. This is why we are alive. So if we're ambassadors, just uh, let's run a scenario here, okay? I want you to imagine that the President of the United States called you up and said, uh, I would like you to be my ambassador to India. Now, India's uh, probably going to outpace China in being the most rapidly growing economy in the world. This is a very strategic ambassadorship. Let's say you accept it. You're the ambassador to India. What kind of things would you do? Do you think you might visit India? Yeah. Do you think you might learn a little bit about their culture, learn a little bit about their history? This is one of these dots for us to connect as Christians in the 21st century in America, that when we really actually start to think, what would I do as an ambassador, uh, it's not all rocket science. So maybe that's a relief for you, because <laughs> there's probably going to be some rocket science later today, right? <laughs> it, it's just a paradigm shift for us to start thinking, well, what would I do if I was going to India as an ambassador? So... Let's continue thinking this way. We, we, we got to understand tribalism in the post-Christian United States, okay? And here's what I mean. Everyone we talk to who's not a Christian in the U.S. is part of some tribe. And just like the people of India, they have a culture. And very often, even if you're both speaking English, they have a language that's a little bit different, like we saw earlier. What would you do if you knew that the people around you were from different tribes, how would you be an ambassador to them? Well, when we understand that the, 
U.S. culture at large has become tribal, we, we realize we have to be resurrect this art of ambassadorship, of being diplomats or ambassadors. So here's a few sample tribes, okay? Um, there's the tribe of militant atheists. That's kind of a tribe. Uh, there's, uh, there's the tribe of evangelical Christians, most of us are from. But, but we're kind of our own tribe. We're very foreign to a lot of Americans right now. Uh, there's the LGBT tribe. There's the tribe, there, there are Muslims and even different tribes of Muslims. The, the real question for you is, I've been praying for you all in preparing this, is I wonder what tribe God has placed in your sphere of influence. See, when I was in mainstream journalism, I, I learned very quickly that I was the only Bible-believing Christian there. And not only was I the only Bible-believing Christian, but as I interacted with my coworkers, each of whom were from different tribes, most of them were pretty sure that evangelical or Bible-believing Christians were closed-minded, bigoted, backwards cave people. They were pretty sure that uh, we're the kind of people who bomb abortion clinics, right? That's what they thought. And, and, and it was incredible to be led by the Spirit of God in being an ambassador to those folks. And, and over time, through relationships, showing them this is what a follower of Christ actually looks like. And what I'm excited about in this room is that there are hundreds of you here today who are called by God to go to different tribes. He's probably already put you among that tribe. Maybe it's the tribe of computer programmers. I, I don't know what the tribe is, but, but I, I want you to be praying as we're going through this. Who has God placed in your life who's not a believer? And, and, and now you realize, well, they're, they're really a foreign tribe. And knowing that now, how will we be cross-cultural ambassadors to them? So as you think about those, those people, that tribe, I want us to adopt the strategies of successful cross-cultural missionaries, okay? Here's what's incredible about the church, the church in recent history. Uh, what we would call evangelical Christianity is actually we are the best in the world at cross-cultural communication when it comes to going to a tribe in Africa, or in Papua New Guinea. We, we're really good at this. We, we've, we've spent years and years researching what to do, and, and here's what we typically do. Well, actually, let's say what we don't do, right? Let's say that God calls you to go to a tribe in Africa, and this tribe, you know that they're cannibalistic. They eat people, okay? When God calls you to that tribe, and you get there, is the very first thing you do, walk up to them and say, hey, it's wrong that you're all eating people. Uh, if you do that, are they going to have you over for dinner, or are they going to have you for dinner, <laughs> right? So, so we know this. We know, okay, if I'm going to a tribe in Africa who has never been exposed to Christianity, and that's part of understanding tribalism, we don't assume they've been exposed to it. We assume if they have been exposed to it, that it's probably been in a negative sense. There's maybe someone who said some really hateful stuff to them, and that person claimed to be a Christian. There's maybe someone who abused them and claimed to be a Christian, we go in assuming they either don't know about Christianity or if they've been exposed, it's maybe been in a negative light, unfortunately. And so what would you do if, if you were called by God to a foreign tribe in Africa? They're cannibalistic. They, they're they're uh, polygamous. They've got multiple wives. They've got all sorts of issues, okay? What would you do? Well, we know what really successful cross-cultural missionaries do. Uh, they go in and the very first thing they do is they they demonstrate God's undeniable love through undeniable actions. So they'll dig a well, or they'll build a medical clinic, or they'll, they'll bring in uh, helpful technologies that save life and make life better, and, and they spend time showing undeniable good actions. And then as they do that, they learn the language of the people to whom they want to show the heart of God. And as they're learning the language of the people, they're building some relationships. And the most successful cross-cultural missionaries, after they've showed God's love through good actions, and they've learned the language, and they've built some rapport and relationship, it's then, after the good works, that they show the good news. Faith comes by hearing the gospel of Christ. And, and, and then they explain, there's a creator God. He made everything. 
And I know I'm not perfect, but anything good you've seen in me is because of what I'm about to explain to you. And that's that all of us were born as slaves to sin, and Jesus came to set us free. And and a good cross-cultural missionary then explains what we would call the gospel, and then the people either accept it or reject it, right? Usually there's some of each. Now, how about the people who reject the gospel? Do you then expect them to live like Christians? Well, not, not if you're operating biblically. You'd expect them to keep acting like slaves of sin. You'd expect them to keep acting like pagans. So can you see how maybe uh, in addition to the normal spiritual confrontation that we have uh, against our unseen enemy, can you see how maybe in the United States we've maybe added some additional unnecessary tension by going to some tribes who don't know Christianity and telling them you need to act like Christians? I mean, Scripture says that they're, they're powerless to act like Christians. And we're actually kind of um, mocking the cross when we do that, to tell people, you can, you can say no to your sin without the power of the cross. Then, then what was the cross about? I know I can't say no to my sin without the power of the cross. So, so if we'd adopt these strategies, think of that tribe in your life. Is it the LGBT tribe? Uh, Is it the computer programmer tribe? Is it your workplace where you're one of the only Christians and Christians are are often mocked? What if, as you go to the tribe that God has called you to, you did these same kind of things? You started to show God's undeniable love through just undeniable good actions. I think one of the hardest things, at least for me, is to keep my mouth shut during that part of the process. Rick Warren once, you know, said that uh, we're supposed to be the body of Christ, and a body has, you know, hands and feet and all, all these parts that help, but in America, very often, the body of Christ has just become a gigantic mouth. And it's true. This is one of the hardest things, but, but we'd know it if we were going to Papua New Guinea, and it takes some discipline, self-control, fruit of the Holy Spirit, right, <laughs> to be praying for folks as you're showing them God's love through undeniable actions, as you're taking the time to learn their language, think about how God came to us in Jesus. We love him because he first loved us. He incarnated himself. He humbled himself and took upon him our flesh. He didn't have to do that. And think about this. He lived among us for 30 years, praying, listening, before he started his public ministry among us. One of my favorite books of the Bible is I pray about, God, how do we represent you in a, in a culture that is now hypersexual and pagan is the book of First Peter. There's an incredible verse in there. First Peter 2, verse 12 says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That word good, and and there's a whole chapter on that word good in here, uh, because it's dozens of times in the New Testament, and it always comes up when it's us being light in the darkness. You probably know Jesus' words in Matthew 5 when he said, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. So let men glorify the Father, how? By, By your good deeds. So the good news and the words and the reasons are all Hugely important. We can't, we can't give the gospel without words and without reasons. But if we give the words and the reasons before we've shown the good deeds, before we've demonstrated the heart of the Father through actions, then, then, then we're not being ambassadors. And, and that's where sometimes we add some unnecessary tension. Think about this. Think about the apologetic of relationship. The apologetic of relationship. In the book of 1 Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, uh, Timothy, you know the faith I've passed on to you because you know me. And Timothy, you know it because you know your mother and your grandmother from whom you received it. It was through relationship that Timothy became a believer. So, So the reasons matter. But what makes the reasons matter is a web of relationship through actions and through love and through learning the language Jesus said in John 13 that really our greatest apologetic is our love. John 13, 35, he said, this is how all people will know you're my disciples because of your love one for another. 
Elsewhere in that same discourse, he said, this is how the world will know that I was sent from the Father because you're, because you're unified as believers. Isn't it interesting to think that our, what we have to offer in relationships by being full of the Holy Spirit and free from sin is, according to Jesus, one of our greatest apologetics. Well, if that's the case, it, it adjusts our definition of success. And here's how. This has been really big for me as I've interacted with foreign tribes, especially in the news media. God doesn't call me to turn people's hearts to him. See, when I operate from that assumption, uh, it's pretty stressful. That's a lot of pressure, right, to turn people's hearts to God. And uh, depending on um, how you interpret the New Testament, it's probably impossible for us to do as humans. So God, he doesn't call you to turn the heart of your coworkers to him. But here's what he does call you to do, to unveil his heart to them. And sometimes we get so stressed out and so hung up on trying to change people's heart that we end up blocking the heart of God that we're supposed to be unveiling. Because we're just so set on them making a decision. And that'll be a great moment when they do. But God's going to have to bring that about, and he's going to bring it about through Christians who show his heart to people who we patiently acknowledge they are, come from totally different values, totally different language, and I'm going to show God's love through actions patiently. I'm going to learn their language. And you know what? If they reject the message in the end, I'm still a success if I know that I represented the heart of God to them. I mean, think about Jesus. How did it end for him? Right? There were some who accepted it, but there were many who rejected it, and um, he got killed by a mob. So, so sometimes for me as an American, I have to adjust my definition of success to everyone agreeing with me and liking me. That is not success. <laughs> success is staying true to the heart of God, lovingly, patiently, self-sacrificingly unveiling the heart of God regardless of how people respond. Well, question, how does this happen? What does this sort of ambassadorship look like? What would be the most effective way if we now understand, okay, uh, the U.S. is, is multi-tribal and multicultural? How can we best now explain the heart of God to the U.S.? Maybe, what if we all pooled all our money from all the U.S. churches and we got like a, a two-minute Super Bowl advertisement, right? And we got our very best communicator of today, hey, man, in two minutes, summarize the heart of God, and we know, you know, uh, however many million, tens of millions, almost half the country is going to be watching this. Would, would that be our most effective way of communicating the heart of God? Well, it doesn't happen that way. And I want to show you a, a, a sociological principle that actually applies to this. This is from Chris Anderson. He's the editor of Wired Magazine. He's a really smart guy. And he, he came up with this idea called the long tail. And this started with sales. And here's the idea. Um, the short, the head is over here. And in the 20th century, in modern society, businesses could make a killing by just selling the products in the head. And here's some examples. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, blockbuster movies, okay, that's, that's the head. Taylor Swift, U2, Madonna, depending on whatever era, okay. The head is the New York Times bestsellers. It's the top 40 in radio, okay. And for a long time, really like the 1960s to about the year 2000, big businesses did really well by just selling what was in the head. So the record labels, they would just sell the top records, they didn't have to sell all these unpopular ones down here. They would just sell the top ones. Blockbuster would just rent the, the new releases of the Blockbuster movies. They didn't have thousands and thousands of options. They just had these ones that were the most popular. Okay? Uh, think, you guys remember like encyclopedias that people would open up and buy? <laughs> right? If you think of this as information, the, those encyclopedias did not have all this information. But they had, you know, the most important part at the beginning. Okay, what Chris Anderson points out in The Long Tail is that as culture has changed and through technology accelerators like the internet, if you want to succeed now in business, 
you have to sell the long tail. So think about this. Blockbuster only sold these movies. It's bankrupt. Netflix came in and said, we'll give you all these. Well, how's Netflix doing? Britannica sold these encyclopedias. Wikipedia said, well, there's also all of this information too. How's Wikipedia doing? How's Britannica doing? Tons and tons of examples. Because remember, Borders bookstores, Borders like Barnes and Noble, they're out of business. They were here. Amazon is here, okay? In the 21st century culture, why, why is the long tail the long table? It's because of tribalism. When you've got a monolithic culture, you can do all your business here. When you're in a tribal culture that's very multicultural, that's very, very diverse, you got to have this stuff if you want to succeed in sales. Now, we're not here because we're concerned about sales. We're here because we're concerned about souls. But the principle is the same, okay? This would be a Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> Big hit speaker, fairly monolithic culture. Lots of people can come. Lots of people can relate to this one speaker. And that's great. And that's biblical. There's times in, in the book of Acts where 3,000 or 5,000 people come to faith in one day. Uh, by the way, you know, Netflix and Amazon, they still sell the products in the head, but they've also adopted the tail. Well, what does this look like for us with evangelism? Well, you know, the head, you got Luis Palau, you got Billy Graham, Greg Laurie, praise God. Let's not sever the head, okay? <laughs> but what's the tail? Well, it's you guys. It's me. We have access to tribes that Billy Graham could never reach. You put Billy Graham at, in his prime in a room of computer programmers, and, and there's a very small chance he's going to lead them to the Lord, short of a miracle, okay? Which I guess that's always a miracle, but anyhow, okay. <laughs> but you know who God's going to use to lead a computer programmer to the Lord because they're, they're down here in the tail somewhere in some tribal subculture? He's going to use one of you who works in a similar field. Or maybe you're their neighbor, but you, you live, you get to know their culture, and you show them God's love through actions. There's a whole chapter on this in the book. I can't read you all the scriptures, but this is biblical. Remember Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, and you'll go be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Did, was that promise given to just the apostles, these guys? No, it was given to 120 Christians, which was the worldwide church at the time, and it was given to all of them. All Christians were going to go make disciples. And as we follow through the book of Acts, this happens. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, the church gets scattered by persecution, and it says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They all went out into these different nooks and crannies that Peter couldn't get to, John and James couldn't get to, but these normal Christians, everyday Christians, could get to. God's plan for spreading the gospel is not a national media campaign. It is, according to his word, us proclaiming the message as ambassadors. In this sense, if you think about it, depending on how you count evangelical Christianity, we have at least 22 million convincing advertisements playing in unique niche markets every day in the United States, right? We start to think of ourselves as living, breathing billboards for Christianity. I'm going to close by telling you about this man. This guy worked on a Ford assembly line around World War II time. Uh, he was not from uh, a, an L.A. or San Francisco type of high-tech tribe. He was a blue-collar worker. And he was not the kind to go to a church and hear some highly educated speaker. But God sent him someone in his workplace, right there on the Ford assembly line in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And, and this guy named Earl Peters kept telling this guy about Jesus and about new life in Christ. And, and this guy eventually believed in Jesus became a Christian, became a pastor, uh, started uh, multiple churches and a Christian school, uh, uh, raised up really thousands of disciples for Christ, 
raised his kids for the Lord, and, and then raised his grandkids for the Lord. And, and I'm one of those grandkids. This is my grandpa. And the only reason he knows Christ uh, is not because of a mass media evangelism campaign, though those are great, and praise God for them. He knows Christ because of the long tail. So I'm going to pray for you guys really quickly. Lord, I just pray that every person in this room will know that they have been strategically placed by you to show your heart to people who will, may never otherwise see it. I pray as we go from here, as we learn all this knowledge and these great reasons today, that our hearts would also be working just as much as our heads, and that we would go full of your love and your patience to show your love through actions, to build relationships, to be the presence of Christ in our workplaces, in our families, to all sorts of tribes who don't know you or who only think the worst about you. Lord, use us to change the world, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.